Welcome to another deep dive, and this time we're going to be doing something a little different. Yeah, we're excited to uh, to really kind of dig into something that we haven't really had a chance to do before. We're diving into poetry. Yes. I Am Poetry, a collection by Adriana Rosales, published just this year. Oh, very cool. Spanning works from 2002 to 2024. Yeah, and I think what's really fascinating about this particular collection is that it's structured almost in reverse. We're starting with her early work. Oh, very cool. So we get to kind of go on this journey with her. I love that. A good origin story is always fun. Absolutely. And I think particularly, you know, we look at her earlier works, the ones collected in early echoes from 2002 to 2019, we really start to see her grapple with these, these really intense emotions. And one of the ways that she does that is through nature. Interesting. Nature becomes this sort of, um, this confidant in a way. It's like her muse. Exactly. So you see this, for example, in The Sea Inside, mm-hmm. which is a poem from 2018. And she uses the vastness of the ocean, right, to kind of grapple with the enormity of life and all of its mysteries. It's interesting because I noticed that throughout this section, Early Echoes, she seems to come back to this idea of the outer world versus the inner world. There's there's always this this interplay between the tangible you know, what we can see and touch, and then the intangible, these bigger, deeper thoughts and feelings. Absolutely. And I think for a young poet, it's a way of making sense of the world around them. Right, exactly. By connecting it back to something that is familiar and yet also full of wonder. And you can really see that in a poem like Viva Modo Tuyo from 2009. Oh, yes. Which translates to live life your way. Mm. And even if you don't speak a lick of Spanish, you can just feel the conviction in her words, you know, this, this fierce sense of individuality of forging your own path. Absolutely. And it, and it makes you wonder, right, does this early exploration of individuality, of authenticity, set the stage for her later work? The work where she starts to tackle social issues head on, you know, where she really finds her voice and uses it to speak truth to power. Oh, that's a great question. And I'm kind of I'm kind of anxious to see where she goes with that. But before we get ahead of ourselves, let's talk about this section, Mexican Waikiki. Yes. Which I found really interesting because even though it's you know, chronologically further along in the collection. Right. These poems are actually from an earlier period in her life. Exactly. We're talking about poems written when she was a teenager, grappling with her identity, specifically her cultural identity. And she does it in such a relatable way. Take Mies Chancletus, for example, the poem from 1992. It's literally a poem about a pair of sandals. Oh, wow. But it's so much more than that, right? Right. It speaks to this universal experience of of being caught between two cultures, trying to figure out where you fit in. You know, I have a feeling that we're going to see this theme of identity come up again and again as we go through this collection. Absolutely. It's a thread that runs deep. And it takes on an even bolder tone in a poem like Mexicana in America from 2011. Hmm. Okay. Here... She's not shying away from the complexities of being bicultural. Oh, that's interesting. She's addressing stereotypes head on. You can feel a shift in her voice, a newfound confidence. Like she's really finding her footing. Exactly. And I think that's one of the things that makes this collection so compelling. Yeah. It's like we're witnessing her evolution as a poet, as a woman, as a human being. Absolutely. It's a privilege to witness this kind of vulnerability, this willingness to share her journey with the world. It's like she's really coming into her own, you know. Finding her voice and using it to make a statement. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And speaking of finding your voice, this next section, well, it takes a bit of a turn. We move away from this broader exploration of identity and culture into something deeply personal, the theme of love and longing. Ah, yes. The section dedicated to JM. I have to admit, I was immediately intrigued. Who is this mysterious JM? What's the story here? Right. It's like we're suddenly given access to this secret, hidden part of her heart. And the poems in this section, they're raw, unfiltered, full of this intense longing. Yeah, like in The Night We Met from 2023 and I Ran to You from 2024. There's so much yearning there, so much raw emotion. It's almost like she's trying to hold on to this connection through her words. You know, one of the things that struck me about these poems, especially I Ran to You, is that it doesn't focus on grand gestures or sweeping declarations of love. It's the tiny moments, the seemingly insignificant details that she elevates to something profound. Right. Like the way someone laughs or the way the light catches their hair. 
those little things that stay with you long after the relationship is over. Exactly. And in doing so, I think she captures something universal about the human experience. We find ourselves clinging to those small, precious moments, especially when we're grieving a loss or longing for something that's out of reach. And a dance of distant hearts? Oh man, that one really got to me. Even without knowing the backstory, the full context of their relationship, you can just feel the ache of a love that transcends physical distance. Absolutely. And it makes you think, doesn't it, about how our experiences, especially those involving love and loss, shape who we become. Mm. Maybe these poems dedicated to JM are Adriana's way of honoring that impact, of preserving a love that's become an integral part of her story. It's like she's creating a space where that love can continue to exist, even if the relationship itself has changed or ended. And, you know, speaking of change, I noticed that there's this underlying sense of acceptance in these poems, a recognition that nothing lasts forever. Like she's finding beauty in the impermanence of it all. You see that, especially in tiny moments where she writes, I've learned to find beauty not in the grand vistas of life, but in the minutia, the seemingly insignificant occurrences that make up a day, a year, a lifetime. It's a really beautiful sentiment, isn't it? This idea that even in the midst of heartbreak, there's still so much beauty to be found if we just take the time to notice it. It's like she's saying, yes, it hurts, but I wouldn't trade those moments for anything. And that kind of brings us full circle, doesn't it? Back to this idea of finding your voice, owning your story, even the messy, complicated parts. Absolutely. And I think what's so compelling about Adriana's work is that she doesn't shy away from those difficult emotions. She leans into the loneliness, the fear, the uncertainty, making those feelings feel less like burdens and more like companions on this journey we call life. It's interesting, though, because even though she's acknowledging the pain, there's also this sense of strength, this refusal to be defined by heartbreak. Yes. And that really comes through in, I'm not the girl you remember, nor the woman you believe I am. It's a powerful declaration of independence. It's like she's saying, I'm not who you thought I was, and that's okay. Right. She's breaking free from expectations, her own expectations, societal expectations, all of it. And in doing so, she's carving out space for her own evolution. It's like she's constantly evolving, redefining what it means to be Adriana. Exactly. And this evolution, it isn't always pretty or comfortable. There's pain, there's uncertainty. But through it all, there's this incredible resilience. And that resilience really shines through in her later poems, like in Whispers of Forever, where she seems to address J.M. directly. You can almost feel the history between them, you know, the weight of their shared past. What's remarkable is that there's no bitterness, no blame. Just this deep well of emotion, this acknowledgement of the indelible mark this person has left on her heart. It's a love letter, plain and simple. And a testament to the transformative power of love even in its absence. Which is a perfect segue to Witness, don't you think? Where she talks about finding beauty in both the light and the shadow. Absolutely. She's recognizing that joy and sorrow, love and loss, they're not mutually exclusive. They're two sides of the same coin. It's like she's embracing the full spectrum of human emotion, the good, the bad, and everything in between. And that takes courage, doesn't it? To be that open, that vulnerable, especially in a world that often tells us to hide our true selves. Especially when those true selves are hurting, when we're feeling lost or alone or afraid, which is why I love I Wait For You, Come Find Me, and Late at Night so much. Those poems just get me right in the feels. They're so raw, so honest. It's like she's giving us permission to not be okay, to acknowledge our pain, our fear, our doubts. And to sit with those emotions rather than trying to run from them. And in doing so, we learn to be more compassionate, both with ourselves and with others. Exactly. And then... Just when you think she succumbed to the darkness, she throws you this lifeline. I am proof enough. Boom. Right. It's a battle cry, a reminder that we are stronger than we think we are. We are survivors. <laughs> and our experiences, even the painful ones, have made us who we are. And that leads us to when everything was lost, which for me is the emotional climax of the collection. It's about finding hope, not in some distant future, but in the here and now. It's a recognition that love transcends loss. That even when everything else is stripped away, love remains. And it's in that love, that connection, that we find the strength to keep going, even when it feels impossible. Which brings us to the final poem, 10,000 Dinners. Which is such a beautiful, understated way to end this collection. After all the emotional turmoil, we're left with this image of quiet intimacy, of a lifetime spent sharing meals and memories with someone you love. It's a reminder that sometimes the simplest things in life are the most meaningful. And that love, in its purest form, is a quiet revolution. It's a testament to the power of connection, 
the beauty of ordinary moments, and the enduring nature of the human spirit. Well said. So to our listeners, as you resurface from this deep dive into IMM poetry, what are you taking with you? What resonates? For me, it's the reminder that our stories, even the messy, complicated ones, have value. That by sharing our truths, by embracing our vulnerabilities, we open ourselves up to connection, to healing, to growth. And isn't that what poetry, what art is all about? To make us feel a little less alone in the world. To remind us that even in the darkest of times, there's always beauty to be found, always hope to be held on to. Absolutely. So until next time, keep searching for those sparks of beauty. Keep exploring the depths of your own experiences. Your stories are worth telling. 